the privilege of serving as the president of Hunter College. Welcome to the first public program of the season here at Roosevelt House. Welcome to those of you who have been frequent flyers at this, these events, and welcome to those of you who are here for the first time. Um, in the category of brand new, this is my first time uh, presiding over an event, standing at this podium as the new interim president of Hunter College. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here in the home of Eleanor and Franklin D. Roosevelt. As you may know, it's, it was a wedding gift uh, from Franklin's mother, Sarah, and maybe that would make you jealous about uh, other wedding gifts that you didn't get from your mother-in-law. On the other hand, if you know anything about the relationship between Sarah and Eleanor, you won't be jealous at all. So, um, turning to our event today, Special thanks to our esteemed Roosevelt House director, Harold Holzer, for his invitation to me to welcome you. And also thanks to the hardworking facilities team at Roosevelt House and Hunter College for a recent renovation, including this handsome, brand new carpeting. You know, I never fully appreciated the responsibilities of being a college president uh, at this scale. Uh, we serve 24,000 students. 2,100 faculty members, 1,600 staff, 49 elevators, 18 escalators, and 2.6 million square footage of Upper East Side real estate, and that's a lot of carpeting. <laughs> this special place and Harold and his team are dedicated to civic engagement, focusing on issues of public policy and human rights, as well as the Roosevelt era history made under this very roof during the 25 years that Franklin and Eleanor lived here. So watch this space. It's gonna be a season of milestones. We're gonna be marking the 90th anniversary of Francis Perkins' visit to President-elect FDR in the library upstairs where we were just sitting. Uh, it was the interview that ended up in her appointment as the first woman to serve in any presidential cabinet and also a key architect of the New Deal. This fall also marks the 75th anniversary of the UN Declaration on Human Rights, which Eleanor steered to passage with her uh, iron will and genius for diplomacy. In fact, one of the first UN meetings that drove towards that result was, head at, was held at the original campus of Hunter College up in the Bronx. Um, tonight, we're gonna be making some history of our own. First, we're gonna be exploring the civil rights legacy of an American leader, one-time senator, vice president, and presidential candidate, Hubert H. Humphrey. You're gonna be hearing less tonight about the Humphrey, I sort of uh, remember, the Vietnam era, um, or the disquieting events of uh, 1968, but instead, we'll be focusing more on the young Humphrey, who fought bigotry as a crusading mayor and all but compelled the Democratic Party to embrace civil rights. It's our great pleasure to welcome New York Times veteran Samuel G. Friedman to Roosevelt House tonight. He's written an absolutely fabulous book about this idealistic progressive. Into the Bright Sunshine, Young, Hu Young Hubert Humphrey and the Fight for Civil Rights is a broad, rich canvas of American life in the days leading up to and following World War II. Samuel G. Friedman is a byline I know well, as all New Yorkers do. He was a staff reporter for the Times for 16 years, during which he wrote both the On Education and On Religion columns. He's written many other books and also contributed to numerous other publications, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, The Guardian, you get the idea. This latest book is an eye-opening, page-turning triumph that fills in a lot of important missing links in civil rights history. Our conversation is gonna be led by Harold Holzer, our perfect host for the last eight years, and a distinguished historian himself with 54 books. How did you write 54 books? That's pretty amazing. My bosses will look the other way. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> and he's got an upcoming book on Lincoln and American immigration, a timely subject. But wait, there's more. It's also my personal privilege to welcome the legendary print and broadcast journalist, Bill Moyers, to Roosevelt House. 
Our discussion tonight is really thanks to Bill, who came up with the idea for the program long before he was at CBS or NBC, before he produced and hosted the iconic Bill Moyers Journal and other PBS programs that earned 25 Emmys. He was the very young press secretary to President Lyndon B. Johnson. And as you will learn, he knew, admired, and was mentored by none other than Hubert Humphrey. So we really do have the dream team tonight. So, sorry for the long preamble, but it's my first time. So I want to get every minute out of it. Um, and it's not uh, too often that you, you get that chance. Harold's going to be leading Sam Friedman and Bill Moyers in this discussion. You'll have time to ask questions yourselves. And then we're all going to head upstairs to the Four Freedoms Room for a book signing and a toast to our very special guests. And you'll also see there on display some of the rare items that Bill has generously donated to Roosevelt House. And thanks very much to Bill for that. So it's my pleasure now to welcome Sam Friedman and Bill Moyers in conversation with Harold Holzer. Thank you, President Kirshner, and thanks for your commitment to Roosevelt House. Um, it's uh, an honor to welcome you for your first hosting duties here at Roosevelt House. And thank you all for braving this incredible rain, which we are hearing pounding on the skylight above with some trepidation, uh, but we'll be fine. <laughs> we will be fine. Um, yes, I'm thrilled, too, to be part of this gathering. Sam, you've written a as, as President Kirshner said, a book that's so rich and full of incident and character and social movements and introduced us to characters uh, that I'd frankly not come across before. Those who influenced uh, Humphrey and those who influenced the country. <laughs> that, that's an amen to that, right? <laughs> and, and Bill, what can I say? Um, Full disclosure, though it's a more a point of honor, I worked with and for Bill 45, starting 45 years ago when I was uh, a, doing publicity for WNET Channel 13 and Bill was doing the journal. As I said to Judith, who I, I will acknowledge in a moment, he was not too demanding, um, but well worth it. What an honor to be associated in any way with this extraordinary man. I was actually on Bill Moyers' journal once, that, and uh, that was the biggest honor of all. But never did I think I would be asking questions and interviewing Bill Moyers. It is intimidating, I will say. We will see. And let me just mention some news I heard today, that in two weeks, um, Bill and his um, partner in all, all that they produced together on television over, over the years, Bill and Judith, and by the way, they've been married almost 69 years, I should mention, which is pretty extraordinary. They will be going to Washington, where the Library of Congress will accept their presentation of 50 years of broadcast excellence from Bill Moyer. So what an honor that is. So I think my first question to both of you is, uh, keying off what president said at the opening, is this a moment for a revisionism, rehabilitation, or re-examination of Hubert Humphrey? I know it's 75 years since the speech we'll be discussing, but what's the impetus and justification? I had a couple of different uh, motivations in that direction. First of all, although this wasn't the major one, I wondered why it was that we've been able to see Lyndon Johnson in his totality. The Lyndon Johnson of the catastrophic escalation in Vietnam, but also the Lyndon Johnson, along with Hubert Humphrey, who pushed through landmark civil rights laws and great society legislation and immigration reform and so on. And why had Humphrey not benefited from a similar kind of rounded view? Why did it seem that his history in the public mind began maybe with the Vietnam War and the violence at the 68 Democratic Convention. But I also felt that beyond the biographical gap of people who, even those who thought they knew Humphrey, not knowing much, if anything at all, about his civil rights work, that there was also a broader historical gap to fill about the civil rights movement of the 1940s. 
And for those who think, you know, justifiably enough in some ways that the movement really begins with Brown versus Board of Ed decision in 54 and with Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955, none of that is possible, much less the legislation that LBJ and King and Humphrey would combine to push through in the 60s. None of that's possible without the civil rights actions of the 1940s, which are very closely tied to the war. And I just have to say, um, considering the domain we're in tonight, and efforts in which, besides such extraordinary black leaders as A. Philip Randolph of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and Walter White of the NAACP, I would argue that the two most important and committed white Americans to that cause in the 1940s were Eleanor Roosevelt and Hubert Humphrey. I first heard, not of, but Hubert Humphrey when I was 14 years old. My father in the small town in East Texas where we live bought a used Magna box. One of those, how do you describe it? <laughs> uh, boxes that brought the radio to us but for the first time. We didn't have a radio until then. And in 1948, my father was, my father was an active and loyal Democrat, and he wanted to listen to the Democratic National Co Convention. He had a habit of inviting me to join him, and, and I did quite often on the evening news because he loved Edward R. Murrah, and so did I. And um, so we listened to the radio together, and we heard the Democratic National Convention. Not all, I, he listened to all of it. I listened to just a part of it, and, and then on comes Hubert Humphrey, who speaks for 10 electrifying and page-turning and history-making minutes. It, in this little southern segregated town, 10%, 20% black, 20%, 30% black, 30% white, uh, it was a startling message, much talked about in the barber shops, uh, at the hotel, uh, uh, by, uh, hotel coffee shop, and elsewhere in the, in the shops around the square of Marshall, Texas. I didn't ask any questions about it. I wasn't conscious of the segregation that engulfed us in that little town. But of course, many years later, 20 years later, I was in Washington, and Hubert Humphrey changed my life. Uh, some of you may know that he made the first speech of any public official calling for a youth corps. And I borrowed liberally from that speech when I wrote a speech for Senator Lyndon Johnson campaigning for vice president in 1960 at the University of Nebraska uh, called a Peace Corps. And two weeks later, uh, Ted Sorensen wrote a speech for John Kennedy that he delivered partially at the University of Michigan, or was it Michigan State? The University of Michigan, uh, announcing a Peace Corps. And as you may call, recall, some of you were, were around at that time, students hung out at that campus until uh, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning, excited about this idea of, of, uh, of, a, of a Peace Corps. And I worked with Humphrey by the time the Peace Corps legislation went up, I worked with Humphrey from the White House where I'd become Lyndon Johnson's assistant and his legislative person. And we worked together hours on the Peace Corps legislation. I got to know Humphrey very well. No man I've ever met could stay on one issue for so long and be fresh in talking about it. He, was, he had it in his mind, he had it in his heart, and he had it in his will because he was intended to pass the legislation even though it would, of course, turn out to be the Kennedy proposal and the Kennedy uh, Peace Corps. Kennedy then nominated me to, uh, be the be, to be the deputy of the Peace Corps to Sergeant Shriver, his brother-in-law, mainly because I knew something about passing bills. I'd been helping LBJ pass uh, legislation in those great society days. And I went up and worked on the Hill with, with, with Senator Humphrey for long hours away from the White House on the weekends 
and we got that legislation completed and introduced. When Kennedy nominated me to be the deputy director, Senator Frank Lauschi, a conservative Democrat from Ohio, asked me in my hearing, how old are you? And I said, I'm, and he said, I, and I said, 28. He said, well, you're too young to, for a job like this. I said, well, wait a minute. I'm actually 25 and a half, uh, <laughs> 20, 28 and a half. And he went, uh, this, this uh, threw him for a loop, and he got angry at me, and he really took after my nomination. Humphrey, in his office, heard about it, came dashing to the floor of the Senate, and made a stunning 28-minute speech <laughs> on the power, history and power of young people in government. He started with, uh, with uh, um, who was it, the young uh, prime minister of uh, England? Uh, Yes, yes. And he came right on down to the heroes of the revolution and, uh, and, 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 and not one of them, so many of them were not in their 30s yet. And then he went on to the heroes of the Greek revolution and, <laughs> and, and 28 minutes later he finished. Uh, and Lausche was sitting there stunned. And, uh, and, but he, and so Humphrey finished this way. If the senator from Ohio shows up as he has promised when this nomination is voted upon and votes against it, I shall be there in full force casting my vote and maybe more for this young man and his nomination. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 it passed. Uh, it passed. So that was when I met Hump, not when I met with him, but when we worked very closely together. I saw him often. He was the floor manager for the Civil Rights Act on which I had worked with others in the White House when it went to the floor for vote. Remember, there's a long filibuster about it. Humphrey broke that filibuster by outlasting Richard Russell, who was, of course, Lyndon Johnson's other uh, uh, boy Friday. And, uh, and, and he chose the liberal over the conservative because Russell said, if you pass this civil rights bill, we're done. But Humphrey worked with Russell and got him to, with others, persuaded him not to enforce, not to do the filibuster. After that, Humphrey knew every vote, when it was coming, how the different senators were going to vote, and we passed it. And then he went to work for it on the House side with the House Democrats. He was, he was relentless, and he was good-spirited. He hosted us at our 30th, my 30th birthday, yeah, it toasted me on my 30th birthday. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Judith and the children uh, heard about it later. But anyway, we, we became very good friends. I would visit him at the House of Hope Church in, in, in St. Paul, where he uh, often attended and sometimes spoke. Uh, and I gave the, the, um, the uh, uh, speech for the dedication of the uh, 50, oh, for, on the 50th anniversary of the 1948 speech, uh, and it was a marvelous occasion. I, I, I met no man more dynamic, no man a better Christian in public life, in the best sense of that word, one who witnesses to what is right and good in society, or who works for it, uh, or who, who, who knew more about it. Uh, you knew that, right? You, yeah, you raised a, a, a couple about of points role. Yeah, that are very, Dear to me, first of all, on the 64 Civil Rights Bill, one thing to understand about Humphrey Achieves in 1948, and I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but in getting the Democratic Party to endorse civil rights and roping Harry Truman into running as a civil rights candidate, which Truman had not wanted to do, that really sets the table for everything that's going to happen with the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, and the Fair Housing Act of 66. And in terms of Humphrey and the filibuster, I found in his papers in the State Historical Society in St. Paul, where I spent low so many hours, happy hours, but many, many hours, this long sheet of sort of newsprint on which every senator's name was printed and boxes next to them to mark whether they were yay or nay. And remember, the way it worked with these bills that the Southern segregationists opposed wasn't that 
the liberals, because there are some liberal Republicans then too, strange to remember, um, they could get 51 votes to pass the bill, but they needed 67 to cut off the filibuster, what was called a cloture vote. And in Humphrey's papers, I found that sheet on which he had marked by hand the cloture vote that ended up succeeding. And he'd hung on to it all these years and kept it in his uh, papers at the State Historical Society. And in terms of Humphrey and religion, you coming out of a ministerial background understand this in a way hardly anybody does, that I think even people who admire Humphrey think of his idealism as being purely of a secular sort. And it definitely had you know, secular enlightenment liberalism woven all the way through it. But he was deeply formed by two movements in religion in the 20th century. One was the social gospel movement. And the social gospel movement, especially as it came through a Protestant America, was this real pushback against a version of fundamentalism that was about personal purity and related issues like temperance and basically trying to perfect oneself for the afterlife. Oh, but pausing, of course, to militate against teaching evolution too. And the social gospel, which actually took the biblical text as being every bit as inerrant as other Protestant fundamentalists did, they said the role of a religious person is to create the kingdom of God on earth. That was their term, the kingdom of God. And what that meant to them was supporting labor rights. It was doing outreach to black Christians. It was the beginning of interfaith work. And Humphrey began to get absorbed in this in his teens, really important to his later life. And then if you flash forward to when he comes back to Minneapolis after graduate school in the early 1940s to start his career in public life, and the interfaith movement is really taking hold then. And the idea that there should be these alliances between liberal and moderate Catholics, Jews, white Protestants, black Protestants, that also is tremendously important to him. And it dovetails totally with his inclination to build coalitions. I relished your writing and, and, and research about the professor he had at LSU. I'd always known that when he came back, when he and Miriam came back from uh, LSU, he was a changed man politically. But I did not know there was this fascinating character, German refugee, who came over here in 1930. Tell us yeah. about his influence on Thank, thank you, I'm glad you asked that, Bill. His name was Rudolf Eberly. And before I get to Eberly, just keep in mind that Humphrey starts graduate school in the fall of 1939. He had to stop out of his undergrad studies at the University of Minnesota for five years because his family had lost their home, lost the drugstore they ran, had to relocate to another town. And frankly, if not for the inspiration and support of Muriel, his wife, he probably never would have gone back to college, would have stayed a small town druggist active in local democratic politics. So he goes to LSU purely because they offer him $400 as a graduate assistantship. And he's married, he and Muriel have their first child. They need the money, and 400 bucks in 1939 would add up to a pretty good amount in 2023. That, that's per semester? Uh, no, one year for the year, I for think. For the year, okay. <laughs> but still. I didn't want anyone to think it was still. a weekly salary. And he goes down there as, you know, a kind of a buy the book new dealer. His concerns are with economic justice. And in that year at LSU, it transforms his life. It makes him the person we recognize. In that year, he lives in a Jim Crow society for the first time. In that year, he makes the first Jewish friends of his life, including one friend who tells the story of his five uncles who are all trapped in Nazi-occupied Europe and will all perish in the Holocaust. And most of all, he studies with Rudolf Eberly. And Rudolf Eberly was this anti-Nazi, one-eighth Jewish sociology professor who was tormented by the way Germany could go within three or four years from this enlightened democracy to a dictatorship. And he started doing field work as a sociologist to answer this question that, again, that tormented him. And because of that field work, and because he had to reveal his one-eighth Jewish ancestry, even though his family had converted to Christianity generations before, but that didn't matter you know, to Hitler, He's kicked out of Germany. He's stripped of his job. He's in the US with his family penniless. 
and ends up scrambling to get a job at LSU. And in the class that Humphrey has with him at LSU, he does three things. First, he talks about his field work, what he learned about the transformation of democracies to dictatorships, about the way demagogues pick off vulnerable groups, always leaving people in the middle thinking they'll never be picked off, and about the complacency of traditional conservatives who thought the Nazis could be their fist, but ultimately they would control the fist instead of the other way around. Sounds familiar, right? Um, and the, secondly, he talked about his family's experience of dispossession. And the last thing is he mapped all of this directly onto race in America. He said explicitly in this class, as Humphrey would remember even decades later, the plight of the Jews in Nazi Germany is the plight of blacks in the Jim Crow South. You have the, you, you, you found the quote that really influenced, one of the quotes that really influenced Humphrey uh, about how Hitler came to power. It was not with the fascist left. It was not with the authoritarian right. It was with? It was with complacency and cowardice. Yeah. Among uh, the middle class. Right, right. And at one point, Eberly looks at his dozen grad students, looks around the room and says, if we were in Germany, only two of you would stand up to the Nazis. And I think Humphrey really took that as a personal challenge and a standard to meet, yeah. because when he finishes his one year at LSU and goes back to Minneapolis, a lot of people from the North would like wipe their brow and say, boy, am I glad I'm out of uh, the benighted, you know, segregated South. For Humphrey, it was the opposite. When he goes back to Minneapolis for the first time, in all the years he's been there in college, he sees the pervasive racism and anti-Semitism in Minneapolis. He sees that there's, as black folks say, there's down south and there's up south. And he sees the up south in Minneapolis. T uh, Sam, tell us, um, by the way, did he not write his LSU thesis on the New Deal? He, he did write his LSU And he was criticized for it, right? He was deservedly criticized. It was kind, <laughs> of, a, a, it was kind of a fan letter to the New Deal. <laughs> Um, I mean, we're for that here. I'm just pointing it out. Well, it's not, you know, I, I think that there are wonderfully more scholarly distinguished tributes to the New Deal than, than Humphreys. I have to admit, I read it because he talked about how a couple of his professors didn't want to give him his master's degree because they thought that it didn't reflect sufficient um, primary source research. And while everything Bill said is right, the bear trap mind amazing ability to synthesize information, um, tremendous powers of concentration, and of course, eloquence. But that particular book was, again, really just right. kind of him swooning over the New Deal. So, so he gets to Minneapolis, and you began to talk about both the racism and the anti-Semitism. He finds there some really hard and open and brutal, some soft and subtle, and... Um, well, let's bring Muriel into the picture, right? She, so he, he marries this woman who I remember as sort of a very quiet, uh, behind-the-scenes person. But there are some great quotes that you have in the book. Muriel mm -hmm. saying, you know, don't be afraid of running for office. Right. I see you in the highest office, I'm paraphrasing. And the other is, not every good speech has to be a long speech, right? Well, no, <laughs> it, it, it's even better than that. This is a few months before the 1948 Democratic Convention when Humphrey is looking down the road at the likelihood he'll have to deliver this speech to sell civil rights when Truman doesn't want it in the platform, the Southern segregationists are vowing to walk out, and he gives a speech at an AFL-CIO convention, and it goes on and on and on. And he's like afterwards so pleased, he thought he really, as the comics would say, he thought he really killed. And Muriel says to him after Hubert, a speech need not be eternal, to be immortal. <laughs> <laughs> that is better. That is better. But, but she had a great political head. She was really sharp. She was really astute. And I'll just mention a couple of ways that manifests itself. First, and Harold was referring to this, when Humphrey is sort of marooned in South Dakota working in the family drugstore in the mid-30s, and that looks like where his destiny ends, he goes to visit his amazing younger sister, Frances, who's put herself through GWU in Washington, and been discovered by Eleanor Roosevelt. And 
on that trip, he goes to Congress, he goes to the Smithsonian, he, you know, writes to Muriel about walking up the steps of the Capitol and saying to Muriel, I know you'll think I'm crazy, but I feel like this is what my life should be. And she says, your dream is my dream. But she goes on in a subsequent in-person conversation to say, if you don't leave your father, you will never have that life. You've got to leave. He can get a different pharmacist for the drugstore. <laughs> and she's right. And it took her urging for him, as I said earlier, to go to school. So that's one example. Another is, and this is such a proof text of the feminist, the second wave feminist phrase about the personal being the political. We could say, in this case, the familial being the political. Humphrey's in Philadelphia in July 1948. The convention is boiling over with tension about civil rights. He knows he's going to give this speech. He doesn't know if it's going to be the end of his political life. He feels a lot of trepidation. And keep in mind, at this time, mail goes twice a day, back and forth. And so he and Muriel are writing several times a day. Muriel was doing what Minnesotans do in the summer, which was scoping out a cottage near a lake where the plan is after Humphrey gets back from the convention, the family will spend a week and then Humphrey will start his senatorial campaign. And she writes to him a few days before the convention starts and says, I heard from this is actually the mother-in-law of the other politician from Minnesota, you might know, or Freeman. I heard from Mrs. Friedman that such and such resort doesn't take Jews. I'm going to drive up there on Sunday and find out. So on the appointed Sunday, she goes there. She confronts the owners. They admit it. And she writes a letter back to Humphrey, to Hubert Humphrey. And it gets to him the morning he's going to deliver the civil rights speech. And keep in mind that the civil rights plank matters as much to anti-Semitism and anti-Catholic feeling as it did to addressing racism. And the letter arrives that morning and says, it's true, they don't take Jews, we cannot stay there, this is against our values, this is contrary to everything we stand for politically, and I cannot help think, but think that that was another case of her urging him to do the morally right thing. I think I learned from you a footnote that they were very poor when they were courting and didn't really have money to get, to, to get married. And he was working for his father in the pharmacy and uh, Muriel suggested that they get married. He said, I can't get married, there's no time. She suggested that they get married at eight o'clock in the morning and they did. Right, well actually his father wanted that because his father didn't want to lose a day of business at the drugstore. But they were living hand to mouth. I mean, um, when they were at LSU, Muriel couldn't work. She often had office jobs of different kinds um, prior to that, but now she had this little baby daughter, Nancy, at home, and she would make these ham salad sandwiches in their little kitchen in Baton Rouge, which Hubert would carry to grad school and sell for a quarter apiece, and that was part of what they needed to do to pay the rent. By the way, those of you who, I know there are many of you in the audience who have commented to me that they love the character of the senior Morgenthau in the Morgenthau biography, will be entranced by H.H., not by me, but by Humphrey's dad, who is just fascinating, not only a, a sort of a conjurer, a patent medicine salesman, right. an oppressive father, but also a real pal, right? Right. Yeah, H.H. H. Humphrey is such a piece of work. And, you know, when you write a biography, you triangulate between someone's own version of their life, if they've set it down, and what you find in other sources. And when Humphrey wrote about H.H., H., it was absolutely adoring and it was monochromatically positive, and it was half true. <laughs> because the, the half true part is that H.H. H. was a real idealist and a real iconoclast in this all conservative Republican town of Dolan, South Dakota, where the family lived. He was a liberal Democrat. He even supported Al Smith, who was reviled for being a Catholic, and he lost his best friend in town over supporting Al Smith. He was an agnostic, in a town where everyone at least made a show of going to church. And he imbued young Hubert and also his sister Frances with that great value system. But H.H. was also partly a little bit of the music man. Um, he had 
made money as a young guy selling these totally bogus patent medicines, which he continued to sell for years to come. Um, he had to know all they were was like alcohol flavored with caramel. Um, he had these harebrained ideas, because he loved opera, that he would order opera records and load them in his truck and drive around to all the farmers and sell them opera records. Mind you, this is a point where crop prices have plummeted. These farmers can't afford anything. They're paying him at the pharmacy by giving him like a chicken, you know, or, you know, or side of beef or something, and he thinks they're gonna buy opera records. So that's the complexity of HH. Let's, b before we get to the 48 convention, which you described so beautifully, and by the way, one of the most beautiful prologues I've ever read about Humphrey returning to the scene late in life to deliver a, a commencement speech, but I don't want to get ahead of it. We've already been dancing around the chronology, but um, he goes to Minneapolis and seeks the mayoralty, loses and then goes back and runs again on a platform of combating a much more overt and violent anti-Semitism that's erupted in the city, and somehow that works, right? In a city with a very small Jewish population. Right, well he's running as a candidate of civil rights and human rights. He's taking on both racism and anti-Semitism. And keep in mind, the black and Jewish communities in Minneapolis comprise maybe 3% of the whole population. So you're not gonna win by mobilizing those constituencies. That's part of the reason they were so powerless there. They just didn't have the numbers. Um, and He's doing this campaign in the face of, at the same time, the first newsreels of the Holocaust are being shown, and the first articles by American journalists in English are showing up in the local papers. All that period of time in the spring of 45 during the campaign, there's a wave of beatings of Jewish kids by the Protestant gangs in town. And the mayor, the incumbent, just says, oh, it's just teenage hooliganism. And Humphrey says, no, it isn't. He said, this city has had an anti-Semitism problem for years. It was never dealt with. It was bound to become violent, and now it has. But he also is taking on a wave of police brutality and harassment that just anticipates, tragically, Derek Chauvin's knee on George Floyd's neck. It's, it's frightening to read it. And he's speaking at black settlement houses. He's going to black churches. His closest political friend and ally in Minneapolis is the publisher of the black newspaper there, the spokesman, Cecil Newman, amazing man. So he's doing things that make zero electoral sense. So why does it succeed? I think partly because a lot of GIs are coming home at this time. They're returning to their families, they're in Quonset huts by the University of Minnesota with their wives, going to school in the GI Bill, and they've come back from war with this idea, at least many of them, we spent all this blood defeating fascism. What are we gonna do about the unfinished agenda at home? So I think they're receptive to it. And there's this really amazing moment in pop culture then, when you have things like Frank Sinatra's song and short film, The House I Live In, and you have these amazing books lifting the rock on what had been the right-wing extremism in America by a writer named John Roy Carlson, Noam de Poon for an Armenian immigrant named Avedis, Arunian, that book was a gigantic bestseller. So there was this moment when you could run on those issues and capture enough of the vote. And the other thing, frankly, is that the incumbent thought, who's this little kid who dares to run against me? Um, and he was very indifferent about running his own campaign, whereas Humphrey being and I'm sure Bill can talk a lot about this from experience, someone who loved retail politics, who did it well. He's giving three or four speeches a night. He's all over the place. He's on the radio. And you, if you run that kind of an energetic campaign, you can beat some of the odds. They had to, they had to bring they him down. Mind. They had to bring him down on his answers to press questions because he gave one, uh, it, he was in one press conference and he gave three answers. One was, 14 minutes long, another one was 16 minutes long, and another was 18 minutes long, and nobody dared ask a question because they wouldn't get home for dinner, the fourth one. Where was Muriel when we needed her? Yeah, exactly. So he, he's also, he's equally tireless as an administrator, right? Going, a presence in 
Minneapolis, neglects a little bit by necessity his home life, his family life, but he's everywhere. He, yes, he is totally on the case of being mayor. He comes in with this commitment to not only pushing through legislation on civil rights and human rights in the form of a fair employment law, a law that will outlaw restrictive covenants in housing, um, a police reform agenda that tragically he'd moved on to the Senate before he could complete. But he comes in with those legislative and administrative aims, but also with this idea that you've got to wake up um, Minneapolis to its own terrible history of bigotry. And even brings in this um, eminent black sociologist from Fisk University, Charles Johnson, to lead what's called a self-survey in which Minneapolitan volunteers talk to people in all the facets of society, education, labor unions, big business, um, religion, and they build what we would now call a database to indelibly show the degree of bigotry in Minneapolis. And Humphrey uses that to force the issue, and he is tireless with this. He's in the mayor's office, and again, you know, at the cost of much of his family life, every night reading every piece of mail. I spent one whole summer doing nothing but reading every piece of mail Humphrey got and responded to as mayor. And it's extraordinary, and some of it was incredibly moving. After the war ended, survivors are sending these letters, and they're addressed like, Mayor Minneapolis, USA. They don't know who Hubert Humphrey is, and a typical letter would be like, I just survived you know, Treblinka, and now I'm in the displaced persons camp so-and-so, and I heard that I have a second cousin named Moshe in Minneapolis. Can you help me find him? And Humphrey is like putting these handwritten notes to his staff, like, get on this. And when black, college-educated black people are writing and saying, I can't get a job, he's, again, putting priority on that for his staff. So all of this has a tremendous effect. And if I can just go on for one more second. How was he at this time? He, well, he got elected mayor in 45, so he's just turned 32 years old. He was only 37 when he gave his speech at uh, the Democratic Convention. He was a kid. So he's 32. He, he, it's only been five years since he got his bachelor's degree. Um, but these stances, they may sound fairly morally obvious now, or maybe not, uh, for reasons we all know, but they're risky. And that becomes most clear one night in 1946, I'm sorry, early 1947, he's coming home from a typical night on the rubber chicken circuit, and his police escort drops him at home, and weirdly the street light nearest his front door is knocked out. So he's fumbling with his key in the front door, and while he's doing it, three bullets zip by his head. And then Muriel bundles him into the house, and when they talk about like what just happened, they realized their pet dog had barked. And they theorized maybe the dog's barking had broken the concentration of the would-be assassin, and that's why he missed. And then, just to add more one other creepy detail, their dog vanishes soon after. And the police ultimately arrest a follower of the Donald Trump of that time, someone named Gerald L. K. Smith, for putting up a bunch of anti-Semitic and anti-black literature around the university campus and outside some of the liberal Protestant churches in town. And they find guns, knives, correspondence with a white supremacist group in Atlanta called the Columbians. And it's quite obvious this is the person who tried to assassinate Humphrey. But for reasons maybe having to do with not wanting to give him a trial where he could play the martyr, Humphrey keeps the news of the assassination out of the newspapers for six weeks, something that would never happen today, and never brings charges. But he almost paid with his life. And instead of being dissuaded after this, it's like full speed ahead. To Pennsylvania, to Philadelphia, to Philadelphia right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to now, I, I just want to take a minute to give us, hopefully this will be a seamless audio experience because I want everyone to hear what Bill Moyer, young Bill Moyers heard in, uh, in Texas with his dad. And this is just a little bit of surviving audio, the most famous part, the part that inspired the title, from Hubert Humphrey in sweltering Philadelphia 
as 75 years ago. Let's see if we can cue it up. Those who say that we are rushing this issue of civil rights, I say to them, we are 172 years late. Listen to the booze. To those who say, to those who say that this civil rights program is an infringement on states' rights, I say this, the time has arrived in America for the Democratic Party to get out of the shadows of states' rights and to walk forthrightly into the bright sunshine of human rights. Tell us what all the booing and commotion was in the hall. Well, the booing is from the Southern delegates who, uh, well, they put such turmoil into the convention at that moment. And there are also cheers from, you know, supporters of civil rights, but they're drowned out by the boos that Sam Rayburn, the famous House Speaker and one of Lyndon Johnson's mentors, gavels the convention to a temporary halt. They go in a recess. He's hoping tempers are going to cool. That is a ridiculous hope. They come back about an hour later, and the vote on Humphrey's plank actually takes place. And when it wins, the Southerners walk out. And one very revealing detail of the walkout is the person who instigates it at that moment is Bull Connor. And it passes by a tiny margin, right? It passes by about 100 votes out of a total of roughly 1,200 delegates. But to give you a sense of what an amazing achievement it was to pass it, again, Harry Truman, though he'd had a lot of sympathies and begun to launch a program on civil rights, had backed away because he was afraid he would lose without the Solid South in the 48 election. The Dixiecrats have vowed to leave, and their plan, it's very devious and it's very relevant to the to today or to 2020, their plan was we're going to run a protest candidate and win enough southern states that neither Truman nor Dewey will get a majority in the Electoral College. And then we, the white supremacist members of Congress from the Deep South, are going to get to dictate with our votes who gets to be the next president. All right? Um, so all of that is in the air. Um, at at the time this vote takes place. And just the, the risk factor of, of giving that speech and the amazingness that it got through, it can hardly be underestimated. And the last kind of data point on that is when we look at a democratic convention now, or for any time in the last 30 to 40 years, we look at a very multicultural set of delegates. In this convention, there were 1,500 delegates, including alternate, alternates of which exactly 17 were black, of which probably two dozen maybe were female. So Humphrey had to convince an entirely white male set of delegates to endorse civil rights. And Truman's reaction is that it's a crackpot mm -hmm. effort, right? So Humphrey is not only committed philosophically, spiritually, but he's a pretty good Paul because as it turns out, as you point out in one of the closing chapter, in the closing chapter of the book, um, Truman ends his campaign in Harlem and is, as you said at the beginning of our discussion, the civil rights candidate. Right. They, they rope Truman into running on civil rights. They basically lash him to the mast of what had been his own civil rights program before he sort of forgot he'd ever started it. I mean, in a lot of ways, Truman, just as inside, reminds me of LBJ because there's a part of him, he's from a border state, there's no reason he should particularly be pro-civil rights. He has forebears who are Confederate soldiers and slave holders. But there are a couple of incidents in which black GIs returning after the war are attacked, murdered. The most notorious has a sergeant named Isaac Woodard's eyes gouged out by a Southern sheriff, and that really affects Truman. But now he's backing away from it. But the speech basically, again, hugs him to death with his own civil rights program. And then two weeks after the convention, Truman desegregates the military and desegregates the federal workforce. The last weekend before the convention, he's the first presidential candidate, probably on anything other than the Trotskyite party, um, 
to give a campaign speech in Harlem. So that was really what was accomplished. And the last thing is the reason Truman wins is he gets a surge of black votes all across the country, but particularly in three swing states, in California, Michigan, and Ohio. Those electoral votes, which he gets only because of the surge of black voters, are his margin of victory over Dewey. The night before the election, I understand, there were 10,000 people who turned out in Harlem to uh, hear uh, Truman, and that, that that gathering was not going to happen before Humphrey's speech. That it, just turned, it was a turning of the page of American history. There's no yeah. question about it. Yeah, not, absolutely. And you know, Bill, when you were talking earlier about some of what Humphrey would do um, in the Senate, this is a little bit beyond most of the uh, chronological cro confines of my book, but no sooner did he get to the Senate than he hires a man named Cyril King, who's the first African-American to ever be a Senate aide, and he takes Cyril King to eat with him in the Senate dining room, effectively desegregating it. And by the way, just to give credit where it's due, he got that idea of showing up with a black you know, meal guest as a way of desegregating from his sister Frances, because that's what Frances had done in the mid-1930s with Eleanor Roosevelt, with, with black workers from a war mobilization program. Before, before we open it to questions, Sam, just tell us briefly about Humphrey's meetings with FDR and with Eleanor. As much, I know we don't know a lot about them, but just sort of describe the circumstances. The meeting with FDR that matters the most in my book happens when Humphrey is, again, in South Dakota, thinking this is where the rainbow ends. But FDR does a train trip through the uh, Great Plains and the Upper Midwest, partly to look at drought conditions, because it's still the Dust Bowl years, um, and partly getting people revved up for what will become the 1936 campaign. And Humphrey, as a young pharmacist in the family drugstore, he and H.H. get invited when the presidential train goes to Huron, South Dakota, which is where the family is living then, get invited to go into the train and meet him. And that has a lasting effect on Humphrey. And I think that the Eleanor Roosevelt partnership, you know, Bill Shorey knows this better than I do, picks up a bit later on. They were both part of this important group of anti-communist liberals who were in the Americans for Democratic Action, you know, along with people like Reinhold Niebuhr and Walter Ruther and Humphrey's good friend Eugenie Anderson. So they certainly meshed then. But I'd say that a lot of the ER effect on Humphrey really came to him indirectly through ER's effect on Francis and then Francis's effect on Hubert because she's active on civil rights about five or six years before Hubert gets active on it. And the letters she's writing to him in the 30s, and they continue on right up to the eve of the convention in 48, are giving him this you know jolt of reality about race and the need to accomplish things on civil rights. And the fact that it's coming from this beloved sister who chronologically was younger, but influentially was definitely like his older sister, I think that matters enormously. Did your impression of Humphrey change, and if so, in what way, between the time you started this nine years ago and finishing it? Well, you know, I'm almost 68, so I was 13 years old watching, no, watching the 68 convention and the beatings of anti-war protesters and the police and being appalled by it. My parents were Gene McCarthy um, Democrats. They were smart and pragmatic. They definitely voted for Hubert Humphrey in the election, but they were typical of many liberals of their time who felt betrayed um, by his stance on Vietnam. And then, of course, I just remember all the ridicule of him. You know, I was a college kid reading Rolling Stone when Hunter S. Thompson infamously, you know, said of Humphrey running in 72, he was campaigning like a rat in heat. And so it's not that I had totally absorbed that view as the only viewer. I never would have done this book to begin with. But in doing this book, I started with an intellectual curiosity and certainly a historical appreciation of what he accomplished. 
but the visceral sense I had of him, of his deep moral character, and of the risks he took, that really deepened incredibly over the course of doing this book. You know, and we talk about what it means to be an ally these days. That's a current term. And at first I thought, until a radio show a week ago, which I'll talk about in a moment, that Humphrey is a quintessential ally. He was the meaning of being an ally. But then uh, the, the radio host, Tavis Smiley, had me on his show, and he was saying he doesn't like the term ally, he prefers partner. And I thought, yes, Humphrey is a quintessential partner. And just to give one last anecdote that speaks to this, after he gives his speech in 48, and amazingly, the civil rights plank triumphs, he is deluged with letters and telegrams. A lot of it is hate mail. A lot of that hate mail comes from the North, by the way. And some of it is praise, some of which is very moving to read. The very first telegram that he gets, and I love these time stamps so you can tell, that gets there 25 minutes before Muriel's congratulatory telegram is from Cecil Newman, the black newspaper publisher in Minneapolis, and really Humphrey's tutor on race in Minneapolis. And when Humphrey writes back subsequently, he says to Cecil Newman, this wasn't my triumph, this was our triumph. It was people like you working for years who made this possible. And that's the meaning of being a partner. With that, let's see who has questions. Michael, you had your hand up first. So wait for the mic, please. I'm Michael Myers. I'm the president of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. I recognize you. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Uh, my question is about black-Jewish relations that you spoke about. We know about Roy Wilkins from the NAACP, Kenneth Clark, the integrationist, the psychologist for Brown v. Board of Education, and Hubert Humphrey. They were all racial integrationists. Now, the blacks and Jews started to separate and get at odds with each other over two issues, busing and affirmative action slash quotas. Yes, correct. I know where Kenneth Clark was and where Roy Wilkins was. Kenneth Clark and, and Kenneth Clark stayed, stayed online and said, we are supporting busing and we support, we support affirmative action, including inclusionary quotas, because we got quoted out, we're gonna get quoted in now. That was Kenneth Clark and Roy Wilkins. Where was, Hubert Humphrey on the issue of quotas and um, black Jewish relations. You know, I didn't read deeply into that part of his life from what I know. Um, first of all, you have to understand he was with Lyndon Johnson at the time Johnson gives his famous speech at Howard University articulating the case for affirmative action. So I can only presume that Humphrey was supportive of it. What I do know from the period of his life that I was steeped in is that he didn't see class issues and issues of dealing with historic discrimination as being vying forms of liberalism and you have to choose one or choose the other. I think he saw them as a both and factor. I mean, I can't remember where he was on issues like busing in 72. I'm guessing that he probably had come out against it by then, but I can't cite an exact um, statement, so I may be wrong in that. The one other thing I want to say on black-Jewish relations, which has been one of the central parts of both my personal life and my writing life, having written books as a Jewish guy about black church and HBCU football and the civil rights movement, is that what I learned from this book is that the Black Jewish Alliance starts in the 40s, and it's a product of World War II. And people like Cecil Newman were articulating in the 30s during the rise of Hitler, this is the same battle. And, in, and just as black GIs went off to World War II with the phrase double victory, victory over fascism abroad and victory over racism at home, Jewish GIs, they didn't have that exact phrase, but they had that same idea. We're gonna fight to save our brethren abroad and they're gonna come back here and demand that we stop being treated like second class citizens in this country. And that really cemented this black Jewish alliance in an incredibly powerful way in the 40s. So this didn't just begin 
again, in what we think of as the beginning of the modern civil rights movement in the 50s. World War II, the, the defeat of fascism and the pregnant questions it asked about the home front does a lot to solidify that coalition. Questions? Yes, right here. Wait for, hi, wait for the mic. My name is Wendy Lewison, and I heard you briefly say something about the rise of Hitler from a democracy to a dictatorship. What, is that research available, or do you have, can you quote it? Or? Uh, Rudolf Eberle's work was published in English. I think, I can't remember if it's called like from dictatorship to Nazism. I, I can't come up with the exact title. Um, but if you go to Amazon or Google Rudolf Eberle, Rudolf with an F, and then it's H-E-B-E-R-L-E, -E -E, it was published in English by Louisiana State University Press. And it's still kicking around. And interestingly, my son, uh, when he was taking a course in uh, the rise of different forms of totalitarianism, totalitarianism when he was an undergrad at Swarthmore, he said, I, Dad, I think I recognize this name, Eberly, and his professor had assigned Eberly's book as supplementary reading. Mm -hmm. So there's still some awareness of it, and it's very disturbingly clairvoyant. Yes, right at the end there, and then Joe. Hi, I'm uh, the same age as you, Mr. Friedman, and so this evening uh, is very meaningful to me because Hubert Humphrey was such an important figure in my childhood. I remember just being so affected by seeing him on television. And my question for you is, if he was so courageous on the subject of human rights, how did he fail so badly on the topic of, let's say, the Vietnamese people's human rights? Well, first of all, I really want Bill to address this because you were in the room, as you know, Lynn Miranda <laughs> would say, Lynn Manuel Miranda would say, when that was happening. My view of that is I have to remember Humphrey was a cold warrior. He was an anti-communist liberal, and I don't want to take you way into the high weeds of. Minnesota Democratic farm labor politics in the 1940s, but suffice it to say that Minnesota was a state where there actually was a very active Communist Party movement. There were a lot of popular front people who ended up being useful idiots. There were fellow travelers, and they attempted to take over the DFL party, as it was called, and Humphrey was part of the faction that fought against them and made it an anti-communist liberal party. And my sense is that Humphrey in, over-interpreted the lesson of that. I think it made him feel that there really is widespread communist subversion in this country, and that the domino theory is a legitimate geopol geopolitical way to look at the world. And you also have to, have to remember, he wasn't the only liberal who viewed the war that way. Bayard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph, and I believe Walter Ruther, all at least for some number of years, were in favor of intervention in Vietnam. People treat Humphrey as if he was like the one outlier on this, but, but far from it. And the other thing I'll say, and I really want to kick this over to Bill, is that I found this very moving oral history from George McGovern. And McGovern had been very close to Humphrey. Francis Humphrey had helped run McGovern's first campaign for Congress. And then, of course, he and Hubert parted bitterly over Vietnam. But they ended up, towards the end of Humphrey's life, reconciling. And they lived in the same DC suburb, and they would often go for walks together. And in this oral history, McGovern recounts Humphrey saying to him, you know, George, people say they only supported the Vietnam War because of Lyndon, but, that, but I want you to know I did it because I thought it was right. I know now I made the wrong decision, but I don't want you to think I would support something I didn't believe in just out of loyalty to someone. Bill, do you like to weigh in? It was a tragedy what happened, that this ebullient, genuinely liberal, open-hearted and open-minded man who felt that politics was the way to change things and to do so peacefully, uh, 
became vice president for a good reason and became subordinate to a man with a powerful, powerful ego who admired Humphrey, wanted Humphrey on the ticket, although he very seldom, he very seldom talked about Humphrey when he was talking about others after the Democratic, before the Democratic, after the Democratic National Convention. But he wanted Humphrey because of what you just said. Humphrey was a cold warrior. He would bring the Northern liberals with him. And Johnson could read the statistics, and he saw that the, the vote, the black vote was increasing anywhere people fought for increasing their rights. And he thought Humphrey would be the surprise choice that would please the black leaders that this gentleman talked about, and would, because he was a Cold War, Cold War go with him on Vietnam. Humphrey's heart was torn apart by that choice and by being in that position. Uh, he used to drop by my office uh, because we had a sympathetic relationship and, and just sort of pull his hair out over a vote coming up on the budget for Vietnam. And, uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson, I've said before, was 13 of the most complicated men I knew. <laughs> and when he, Winston Churchill died, Johnson wanted desperately to go to the funeral, but he had a serious case of, uh, of potential pneumonia, but a very severe cold. And the doctor said, no, you can't travel. So everyone thought that LBJ would appoint, would ask Humphrey to go, and Humphrey desired to go. He yearned to go. He would like to see this man whom he had admired, and, but LBJ wouldn't let him. And it, 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 it crushed him uh, for a while. Uh, and so he, he once said, I think you have this in your book, that I was against the war until I moved into the White House, mm -hmm. and in the White House, I was for it. Yeah, th that's not in my book, but that definitely twigs with my sense. And you know, we know from the LBJ tapes, he was divided too. Oh. There are these conversations he's having with Richard Russell in 64 and 65. He knows it's a disaster, and yet he can't stop adding fuel to that fire. As I say, it was a tragedy for the country, for both men, and it, it kept Humphrey from becoming president. Yeah. Well, that and Gene McCarthy's churlish last minute begrudging endorsement. I have to think that if, that if Gene McCarthy had given a wholehearted endorsement yeah. a month before the election, there would have been a different result. Judith and I were in Humphrey's suite at the, at, during the Chicago convention. I was out of government. I was publishing Newsday, so we felt we could go, and we did. Humphrey wanted us to come. Watching his face as he looked down on the park and on Grand Avenue, go from a beaming, hopeful, uh, positive optimist to realizing as a serious politician who can add the figures that it was going to be costly, very, very costly. He was sad the rest of the, of the night. Uh, and of course, when he died, he died, one could say, alone in the sense that all of his passionate followers, with a few exceptions, had disappeared. And they referred to him in the tone you quote in your book, some of them, I think, about, oh, he's an awful man, you know. Thank God we won't. Hunter Thompson yeah. said he's like a rat, as you say. Yeah, I mean, even, even in Minneapolis, one of the jokes was when they named the previous football and baseball stadium the Metro Dome for him, the sardonic joke in town, was that they called it the Humphrey Dome because it was filled with hot air. Um, which is brutal and cruel to someone who's dying of cancer at the age of 66. But also to give you a sense, share something from the book about how petty the feeling was. When Humphrey loses in 68 and comes back to Minneapolis and wants to teach at the University of Minnesota, I mean, what an illustrious life. Who wouldn't want this person on their faculty? Um, first, the faculty rejects him because he never did his dissertation. So he's ABD, as, they, as we say in higher ed. And then um, there's a, a subset of the faculty 
who have non-traditional backgrounds. And very interesting, a guy named Hy Berman, who was very far on the left, politically very different from Humphrey, but they really liked each other. Hy Berman is, you know, befriends Humphrey and tries to introduce him to other non-traditional faculty. And one of the things the non-traditional faculty have is a poker playing club um, called the 39s, I think, or 39ers, something like that. They won't let Humphrey play poker with them. And that's how pedally cruel it got. So the, may I just say one yeah. thing? I've read, I read a lot of political books. I, I think they tell a powerful story of America, win or lose. But I never read a book that I learned so much that I didn't know about somebody I thought I knew. <laughs> and it's a great endorsement. I wouldn't well, coming from you. <laughs> I just, I just think this is, this is a Pulitzer book. I really do, and I urge do I get all to of die you now? to read it. <laughs> what? I said, do I get to die now? <laughs> this is, I think we're going to adjourn upstairs. This has been an extraordinary evening, a combination of reminiscence and research and great storytelling. So thank you. <laughs>